So welcome once again to the Wiki Weekdays podcast. I am Lucas Holland, and I am joined, as always, by Carl Smallwood. Say hello, Carl. Hello, hello Carl. Oh, he's in. He's in. And Carl, I p- people can probably tell by looking at the podcast, I'm very tired today. I haven't slept much, but I'm ready for some podcasting, are you? Uh, I am, yes, but last thing, you don't need to clarify that you're tired. We're in our 30s now, Lucas, it's implied. <laughs> It'd be more surprising if we weren't tired. It's like, I know I'm just extra special tired today, uh, so okay. I reckon there's going to be a couple more line flubbages than usual. It's like, when I get to my mum's point where she has 10 cups of coffee a day. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm at that point where, like, I don't know, since I hit about 29, 30, mm-hmm. if I have a coffee, like... In the first few hours of my day, it just messes me up completely. Oh, okay. I like the ritual. I have like a little espresso machine next to my bed. Mm. So when I get up in the morning, I'll um, uh, get my exercise stuff out. I'll have a quick espresso. I'll read me emails and stuff, and I'll do exercise for the day with a protein shake. It helps. I, I it like, doesn't. you know, when I was working in a restaurant, I was like, you know, a little bit younger, a little bit fitter. Mm-hmm. And I always like ate, you know cranking those coffees out, and then I I started working from home, and I'm like, oh no, but if I have a coffee, my tummy hurts. It's, it's the stuff. weirdest thing, isn't it? When you're younger, you can like just like what shotgun energy drinks. I used to go on nights out and have like ten vodka Red Bulls. It's like, why? I don't need the energy. I'm twenty, <laughs> and so now when make... I need it, I'm like, oh, can't can't do coffee in the first four hours or the last four hours of the day. It's yeah. like, great, great. It's like, where's the Red Bull for people whose tummy hurts? Where's that? <laughs> I guess it's just kombucha, isn't it? That's the thing that you drink when you're 30. You still right. drink kombucha. How many people are going to be like, drink matcha tea? I'm like, okay, okay. okay. Drink turmeric lattes, so it just dyes your house yellow. <laughs> <laughs> God. Shotgun the walls, Carl. <laughs> Have you ever seen that picture of that cat? Or it's like, oh, turmeric gets rid of fleas. It's like, I put it on my cat when I'm a cat's just yellow. <laughs> no. It's just this tiny little yellow cat. And obviously you can't let it go on anything because it's going to ruin it. So it's just like yeah. behind like this screen. It's not allowed to move. Because it's so turmeric, confused. Like, turmeric has a look at things and just stains them. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's like, I love me some Indian food, but like there are some permo stains on my oven. So it's like, <laughs> I'll get my takeaway and I'll put it down and the oil's on the bottom. Like, oh, That's dear. not happening. That's how you get the flavours, Carl. Just the stains make the flavours happen. But we're not here to talk about Indian food, unless we are, because, you know, this is the Wiki Weekdays podcast. I don't know what you're going to talk about. We could be talking about anything, as long as there's a wiki entry. Sorry for that for anyone who's like, it's your first time listener, or you're you're not getting the theme yet of just once a week, me and Lucas will come in with one wiki we found on the internet. We don't tell the other one what it's going to be, and we compete for you, our audience at home. So let us know in the comments or wherever else you can, like social media stuff, which wiki you thought won this week. And sometimes no, 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 theme, Carl. Sometimes not. You've destroyed your own alliteration. It's which wiki won this week. Not you thought. Okay. No, no, the, bad. Not, there's no thinking about it. There's definitive answers. Which wiki won this week? Okay, my so, bad, my bad, my bad. You know, let us know in the comments. But Carl... You are going to start us off this week, aren't you? Yeah, so Lucas, I've gone for just now a straight-up Wikipedia entry on a very popular show. Perhaps one of the most popular shows of the last 10 years. A surprisingly and, some would say, depressingly popular. Also, there's a fly flying around my apartment. I did did just see the little (laughs) whip. If someone just sees the raisin coming in, that's why. uh... And that show it... I was going to say, like, we have had a a bit of a track record between the first, like, you know, series of episodes here where I have also managed to bring in a TV TV show without Mm -hmm. talking about it. Like, there was no no prior conversation other than, do we want to do a theme this week? And I said, well, we didn't announce a theme last episode, so no. But I've also brought a TV show, maybe a less popular one. Okay, but so I'm gonna, we'll find I'm gonna, out about that later. So my TV show that we're talking about, and as always, kind of links to the wiki we're referring to below, is The Big Bang Theory. And I can just see the look on Lucas's face. So Lucas, it's not as evident from like my setup, because you can just see Mr. Skellington. Mm-hmm. But, but from yours, you can see you've got your YouTuber gamer shelf in the background, you've got your Stitch, you've got all your nerdish um, uh, accoutrements. We are both nerds, Yes. We should be the primary demographic for Big Bang Theory. Yeah, and like, you know, we use the terms like nerd and geek 
a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's not meant to be in a disparaging way because I have to clarify that when we're talking about Big Bang Theory. Because Big Bang Theory seems to be wanting to use it in a very disparaging way. and Yeah, and nerd and geek culture are more like, that it is what's popular now, because that's the whole thing. Like, Marvel movies are making, like, gangbusters at the movie studios, and yet you still have some people who cling to that um, label of, oh, I'm a nerd, I'm an outcast. It's like, no, you just don't shower and hate women. It's like, it's different. <laughs> that's a different and, thing. But that's not, we're not, we're not saying that's what nerds are. No, we're saying that there's a subset of nerds who cling to that like um, outsider status, who maybe that would refer to. But Big Bang Theory kind of helped bring nerd culture into the mainstream. Love mm-hmm. it or hate it. And it is, as mentioned, one of the most popular shows of the last 10 years. It is our generation's equivalent of Friends. Like What Friends was to Gen X, the Big Bang Theory was to millennials. For the same I think set. obviously you would throw uh, Him Yim, How I Met Your Mother in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but That's yeah, kind of like the in-between, isn't it? Yeah, there's definitely one of those shows that, I should say, you know, spanned like 10 seasons or whatever and was the defining sitcom of an entire decade, basically. I think it should be held up as well. It's the last sitcom. As in, like, it's the last traditional format sitcom because um, something I like to discuss when it comes to like media and stuff, is especially long-running media, is how it adapts to the changing landscape because 10 years is a long time in television. Mm-hmm. To the point where, and I think one of the best examples of that in the Big Bang Theory is the first few episodes of the Big Bang Theory, the first few seasons were about I think, 24, 26 minutes long, which is fairly standard in you know television, isn't it? For like half an hour, you, it's 22, it's 24 minutes long, so you can put in like six to eight minutes long of ads. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Do you know how long episodes of the latest season were in some cases? I mean, I don't. I would have, if you asked me without setting it up like that, I would have just assumed the entire show ran for half an hour, like, you know, mm. pl- half an hour including ads, so they were always 22, 24, 26 minutes. Okay. So what's the least amount of like content you'd accept from a half an hour long time slot? I mean, to me, I've stopped watching TV already because mm. of that stuff, so like, to me, as somebody who's, you know, spent the last 10 years not watching much traditional tv i would say like fucking 27 minutes but i reckon for you know actual traditional tv 22 yes you think like over at least over 20 so two thirds Mm -hmm. of the content there were episodes of the last season of the behind theory that were 18 minutes long oh my god yeah so you had 18 minutes of content 12 minutes of ads which is bordering on 50 50 because i think that's so fascinating to look at don't you yeah you can literally see the the down the decline of terrestrial television, cable television, by looking at a graph of how long the episodes are. Of like you can literally see them like just putting more ads in as the revenue for ads drops and the viewership craters. As you can just see Netflix taking more and more money away as they slip more and more adverts in there. But yeah, I actually I actually found out how egregious American television adverts are. Oh, it's horrendous, yes. Through Every Big Bang minutes. Theory, because like I found out um, discussing with somebody like years ago that mm-hmm. oh, when you watch Big Bang Theory over here, you get a couple one block of ads in the middle where you can yeah, walk that's, away, that's go make yourself a cup of tea, or go to the toilet or whatever. Whereas you know the Big Bang Theory intro happens and then there's an advert, and I was like, what? Yeah. So this would be interesting for Americans listening or watching, where and um, over in the UK. Adverts on terrestrial television are incredibly heavily regulated. Mm-hmm. And you have to, by law, have a minimum amount of content before you're allowed to show an ad. And that is usually, um, I think it's the ratio. It changes on year to year, but it's about six minutes for every half an hour of content, which is why most things are like 24 minutes. And it actually ends up influencing some TV shows because British versions of American sitcoms sometimes end up being longer. Mm, because yeah. we get more content because they have to put more content in to run more ads or sorry, to fit with that ad structure and there's no such law in America which is why you'll have like three to four minutes of content then a 30 second ad break then three to four minutes and another 30 second ad break and for British people watching that's why when you sometimes watch American sitcoms there'll be like you know just a one second of a black screen or there'll be like a splash screen 
to lead you into the next scene because that's where in America that will be an ad break. Yeah, there's quite a lot of times where you you don't really notice it until you know about that. But yeah, with the Big Bang Theory, they'll do like the zoom in to like the splash screen with the atoms on it, mm-hmm. and then like that will be as you say, just a marker of that would have been where the Americans had an ad break, but we didn't. And you can see that that happens like maybe two or three times in an episode where we don't get ad breaks. It's like, oh, Yeah, and I think you'll notice that a lot, a lot of Americans like, can't believe that. Like, it's literally enshrined in our law that like, you can't put ads in. And obviously, a lot of companies try and push that because they make more money when they can put more ads in. And a couple of things that have been done over the years... Um, include removing intros from syndication. Jack Lennon shows in syndication, they'll just not do the intro because oh. that 30 second intro means now the show's 30 seconds shorter. That's 30 seconds more adverts. But the most hilarious one for me is that sometimes some studios or some stations, I should say, like airing um, old reruns, will ever so slightly speed up TV shows by like one or two percent. Oh, okay. So they'll go, they'll speed the entire thing up by one or two percent, and then they'll send someone in. Joe, sometimes like you'll have like a a hanging sentence. Mm. Like we just had then. There was a, a brief pause there before you answered. They'll sometimes go to the effort of going in and getting someone to edit all those out. Oh. Like a speed, like speed runners, where they try and like shave frames off a run mm-hmm. to save it. And you think, oh, why would you like do this to sh- save a few frames? Because over the course of a half an hour run, that saves you thirty seconds. That's Same one thing. extra advert you can slot That's in one there. one extra ad, yeah. Which is crazy. Uh, but, you know, we're getting a little um, uh, beside ourselves there. So The Big Bang Theory is an American television sitcom created by known enemy of entertainment, Chuck Lorre and Bill Brady. Known <laughs> for creating probably one of the worst sitcoms, I think, which is Two and a Half Men. I, I fucking hate Two and a Half Men. I, I remember when I was a teenager, you know, it was one of those background Comedy Central sitcoms that just mm-hmm. I'd let run. Um and yeah, I remember going back and a few years ago being, oh, two and a half men. Just what was two and a half men actually like? And it is a way more unfunny than I remember, and b horribly so. Yes. Somehow even more sexist and misogynist than I remembered, and I remembered mm-hmm. it being bad. Yeah, and it's just Chuck Lorre is um just awful, and like almost all of his sitcoms are terrible, including the Big Bang. Which is like, but, no, I do. It is a guilty pleasure for me. I consider it to be fast food television. You know it's not good for you, but sometimes you just want a Big Mac. Sometimes I, you just want to while away 20 minutes. I did enjoy the first couple of seasons of Big Bang Theory, especially as they kind of tried to make it more about, you know, the hardships, quote unquote, mm-hmm. of being a hyper intelligent professor at a university while also being a geek. It's like. The first part I can't uh, associate with, but the second part I can. Yeah, it's also fun to hate watch and just see what kind of stuff they portray as being like, you know, nerdy or um, niche. Like the episodes where it's like them queuing up to go watch Star Wars and it's portrayed as this like, oh, who the hell is going to queue up to go watch a Star Wars movie? It's like, fucking everybody, it's yeah. Star Wars. Yeah, <sighs> it's definitely the... What Chuck Glory imagines the mainstream media imagines geeks to be. Yeah, it's that. It's like um, you know, that whole thing. It's like um, a, a stupid person's idea of what a smart person looks like. Mm-hmm. It's that this is like you know a non-nerd's idea of what a nerd looks like, and their idea is like it's almost bordering on shit from like the eighties. Mm, yeah, like they like you no know, right down to like, you know the fucking like the thick rimmed glasses and the oh, well actually, which to be fair, we've all met that guy. Well, actually, I've never met five Carl, of them in a row. I've never met that kind of joke. I've never met five of them in a row, though. That's the thing. Four? Four well, of them, right? group of five. So the show originally centered on five characters living in Pasadena. And can you tell me the names of all five characters, Lucas, for five bonus points? That'll be nothing. Uh, do, do I get podcast points, though? You get podcast points, yeah. Okay. Um, so that would be uh, Leonard Hofstadter, Sheldon Ooh, Cooper... Names. Um, this is where I saw the first two I can do full names, and then it's yeah. um, Howard, Raj, and Penny. Howard, Raj. Ooh. Howard, Raj. And Penny, right? Penny, yeah, okay, Penny. I was double checking that Penny count was one of the main five, yeah. I was going to say because there's the four geeks, and then Penny, and then obviously yeah. they introduce like um, Amy, Bernadette, and then a couple yeah. of other like of the side character geeks as well. 
And Stewart, yeah. And so, Stewart, uh, so, of course, yes. As Lucas said, we have Leonard Hofstetter, played by Johnny Galecki, who's an actor who's in a lot more stuff than I expected, because he's like a really big, like, that guy. You know, when you're like watching a movie, like, hey, it's that guy. That's Johnny Galecki. He's in so many movies where he just plays like slimy businessman in the back, or toady businessman or underling. Let me tell you, I had a shock when I rewatched Mr. Bean the movie and Johnny Galecki turns up on a motorbike as the sleazeball boyfriend. Yeah. I was like, no, no. But- How is he like the the dirty, like weedy, just untrustworthy boyfriend on a motorbike? Like he's not badass enough to play that role. He's nothing like the guy's got some range. Then we have Sheldon Cooper played by Jim Parsons, who is another one where like he's basically playing against type. Like the guy has been typecasted as a fuck, but Something you'll notice if you watch Big Bang Theory is that near universally in every episode, Sheldon wears long sleeve shirts. Mm. And one of the reasons they had to do that is because um, Jim Parsons, who plays him, is yeah, Jim Parsons. Yeah. Um, he's really fit in real life. Like he's a former basketball player. Joke, he's so tall and awkward. Oh, right. Like okay. he played basketball in college or something. So he's really in shape. Mm-hmm. So they had to do that to hide the fact he's got quite defined muscle definition. It's like he's supposed to be a nerd who never stands up, who never does anything. Yeah, he is meant to be like opposed to exercise in almost every way. Yeah, and then we have um, Penny, played by uh, Kaylee Cuco. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Aerospace engineer Howard Wallowitz, played by Simon Helberg. And astrophysicist Raj Cooper Foley, played by Kunal Naya. And then we've got um, Amy Farrah Fowler, played by Maya Biak, who's an actual, or Bialik, I should say, who's an actual microbiologist in real life. So she actually has the same degree her character does. Um, Bernadette Ratankowski, played by Melissa Roche. And then st- comic book owner Stuart Bloom, by Kevin Sussman, who I think is one of the characters I ended up liking the most in later seasons. Because I don't generally like the sad sack character, but there's just something about the character of Stuart where I just feel so fucking bad for him. But, but at the same time, you don't, because he ends up like living off mm-hmm. um, Howard and Bernadette like, in later seasons and guilting them into continuing to like, live their rent free for doing fuck all. But I think it's just the the actor who plays him. It's like, it would be in mm-hmm. another Chuck Lorre sitcom, Two and a Half Men, the Alan. I fucking hate the character of oh, Alan. God, yeah. And Stuart's essentially the same character, but there's just something about the actor I like more. And it's kind of weird because I ended up liking um, Alan Cryer, I think his name is, or John Cryer, who plays Alan. I like him as an actor, but I don't like the character he plays. Not at all, no. And here's something that actually surprised me, and this is something fans of the show, which believe it or not, folks, it does have will point out when you say that it got canned laughter. The show was filmed in front of a live audience for all episodes. So every single one of the 279 episodes produced were filmed in front of a live audience. And yes, they really are laughing. Boy, does it feel like canned laughter, though. That's the thing. It feels like canned laughter. But fans of the show will very be quick to point out it was filmed in front of a live audience. And as with all things filmed in front of a live audience, how much they massage those reactions is up for debate because it says here that it's only for a live studio audience that was like, you know, handled by Chuck Lorre Productions. Mm-hmm. So like his own production studio was like mixing the final sound edit. And there are those clips out there of like, oh, here's a guy with a really distinctive obnoxious laugh. You can hear in multiple episodes doing the same laugh. And they could have had the same guy in for multiple tapings or as many, including myself, suspect, maybe they just piped in this guy, like, you know, some laughter. Mm-hmm. to um, uh, fill out an otherwise bad joke. Yeah, because technically you can still film in front of a live audience and get audience laughter, but it doesn't mean that what they mm-hmm. used in the episode is genuinely just the laughter that they captured. Yeah, and there's a great um, uh, Charlie Brooker bit about that where he talks. He's got a great series on like behind-the-scenes television nonsense, mm. and one of them is how you can use editing to hide bad jokes. And he shows, like, here's, like, you know, I, I film myself having a conversation with three people for, like, you know, half an hour. Here's the editor to make me look like I'm dying on my ass. Here's the editor to make it look like we had a fight. Here's the editor to look like I'm hilarious. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways you can massage um, the actual reality of a situation. But as with all, like, sitcoms with a laugh track or even with a live audience, I do love those edits of when people edit out the laughs. Where it's just, it just makes it look like the Big Bang crew are just the most anti-social fuckers in the world, which is kind of true, I guess. It, it, I guess that show would be true to form if it was like that. But... Because, yeah, if you go watch it like without a laugh track, it's four guys sat down 
and every 30 seconds someone says something and no one reacts. Which, you know what? <laughs> that's like my... I joined the Anime Society in uni. That's what that was like. Yeah. Not far off. And it is... It does, like, really point out when you watch one of those edits. If anyone hasn't ever watched Go. an edit, I would I would recommend just going and Go watch, like, Big Bang or, you know, How I Met Your Mother Friends. or Seinfeld or Friends or whatever... Whichever, you know, takes your flavour of just an episode or whatever without the laugh track. Because it's jarring to see how unnatural, like, and they, stilted, the yeah. conversations actually are, if you think about it. And it's just the conversation. Yeah, and it can be kind of good sometimes. Like, I love, like, the Fresh Prince for some of those where, like, you know, they sometimes play off the audience. Like, you know, when celebrities come in and they're like, yeah, I know. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. big deal, stuff like that. But with this show, it's not so great. So, production. The show's pilot was uh, premiered on September 24th, 2007. This is the second pilot for the show. It's a different, altogether, um, uh, much less popular pilot was produced in 2006 that never aired. The structure was different from the current series, um, and the only main characters retaining both pilots were Leonard, um, Johnny Galecki, and Sheldon, Jim Parsons, who were named after Sheldon Leonard, a longtime figure in episodic television. Which is nice. I like when they do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice throwback. And um, I've watched the bits and pieces of the original pilot that were on YouTube, you know, as of a few years ago. It's not and it, they are way more abrasive. And you can yeah. say that maybe Sheldon's still an abrasive character, but it it was not a good pilot. It was not now. Sure. The key difference is, is that they have the female lead is Katie, a street hardened, tough as nails woman with a vulnerable interior. And Gilda, a scientist colleague and friend of the male characters. Sheldon and Leonard meet Kate after she breaks with her boyfriend and invite to share their apartment. Gilda is threatened by Katie's presence. Test audience is reactive negatively to um, the female characters, but like Sheldon and Leonard. And it's just one of those things of like, yeah, there it is. There's the Chuck Lorry sexism coming in of like, a woman feels threatened. And I think... That's I a woman written by a man, all right. I can't remember if it's the same actress or not, but I I remember them having the... Um, like nerdy love interest to Leonard, and I think it might be the same actress that was in the pilot. It but seems like to a be, re, yeah. a, you know, a reworked character. The only two actors it says here that came um, carried over were Johnny Galecki and Jim Parsons. Like, right, they retooled okay. the concept, and it was picked up mm -hmm. and became one of the most popular shows on television. As I said, rivaling Friends in both, like you know, the length of its um, uh, series run and popularity and money made. Because the reason I like to compare it to Friends. Um, rather than How I Met Your Mother, is that Friends very famously had the ensemble cast mm -hmm. who were the highest paid people on television. And then so that I think it's like, ended up repeating itself with Big Bang, essentially. Yeah. yeah, where they were paid, like I think, towards the end, similar to with Friends, a million dollars an episode plus a shit ton on the back end. So they got like a kickback on all the syndication rights, which are considerable. If If every other, you know, kind of country and channel has a similar length of like syndication for big bang mm -hmm. as e4 fucking does yep. over here or did i don't know anymore but e4 over here which is like you know a channel four side channel um they just Didn't had big again. bang and maybe like you know friends and a couple of other shows just on loop yep. since it was maybe in like season three or something yeah, and here's something that you, um, you you might not know, Lucas, science consultants. So uh, David Salzberg, mm. a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of California, checks scripts and provides dialogue, mathematics equations, and diagrams, and uses props. So one of the things that like, a lot of scientists and mathematicians and nerds in general like about the Big Bang Theory is that while their pop culture references and, and the hints they have towards them are a bit cringy, all the science is rock fucking solid because they mm -hmm. had an actual like PhD mathematician astrophysicist sign off on everything. Yeah, it's similar to the other example I can think of in The Simpsons, where again yeah. they just very good at making sure that the science on the boards and everything in the background is like actually consulted by yeah. people who know what the fuck they're talking about. And that's because a bunch of people on The Simpsons had like degrees in mathematics and then they moved on to Futurama, an ostensibly like, you know, science fiction show, or sorry, an ostensibly like, you know, science backed show. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, they had all of the stuff in the background as like actual, like real science or a basis in real science. And there's a quote from, I think it's David X. Cohen, who worked on it, who was like, this might be the smartest writing room ever assembled. 
because like half of us have got degrees Fair. in like mathematics and physics. Mm-hmm. I think they even like created a new theorem or equation for an episode where they're swapping bodies. Like they oh, designed right. a, a, a new equation to work out that they'd be able to do that. So, like you know what? <laughs> That's for another episode. But they made it a is, theme yeah. song. And do you know who sung the theme song? Uh, BNL. The Bare Naked, Bare Naked Ladies. Ladies. And I, yeah. I only know that because, like, there's a point in, like, a community episode where, they, like, Jeff is like, no one likes Bare Naked Ladies as much as they say they do. And they're like, leave BNL alone. It's like they don't deserve abbreviation. No one calls them BNL. See, the Bare Naked Ladies are a pretty decent band. So I've Canadian. got no problem with them. I've yeah. got no issue. I've got no qualms. I've got no beef with the Bare Naked Ladies. And I, an alternative I, rock band. I heard... <laughs> Big Bang Theory's intro enough that I had that shit memorised because it's oh, a yeah. catchy song. It's a really good song. It's almost like you should probably get a band who's used to making poppy, catchy music to make your theme song. Mm-hmm. It says here that it uh, describes the history and formation of the universe and the Earth. The co-lead singer, Ed Robertson, was asked by Laurie and Prey to write a theme song for the show after the producers attend one of the band's concerts. Um, coincidentally, Robertson had recently read Simon Singh's book, Big Bang, and at the concert, he improvised a freestyle rap about the origins of the universe, which Damn. provided the basis for the theme song. Freestyle on that shit, that's impressive. Yeah. Uh, oh, here we go. So it wasn't until 2007 that a full-length, 1 minute 45 seconds version of the song was released commercially, although some official, unofficial page identify the song as History of Everything. The cover art for the single identifies the title as simply the Big Bang Theory theme song. So mm. it's never officially had a name, it's just the Big Bang Theory theme song. It okay. says here that in September 2015, TMZ uncovered court documents showing that Stephen Page sued former bandmate Robertson over the song, alleging that he promised 20% of the proceeds, but that Robertson had kept all the money for himself. If you, I think it says in the credits, I think the creditation is to bare naked ladies, they should all mm-hmm. be getting a cut. Yeah. And, you know, the music industry is rife with this sort of shit. And then we have Simply, mm-hmm. or follow up next, it's a, a brief section on salaries. So I'm not going to go through all of it, but I'm just going to start with the first three seasons, Galecki, Parsons, and Kuko, the three mates out of the show, received $60,000 per episode. So Ooh. the 24-episode season, $60,000. So that's like sixty grand a week. That's like on, like, footballer money right there, isn't it? Yeah, that's already quite a lot of money considering that they were all relatively unknown, and it was, you know, a small show at the time, obviously, because mm-hmm. it's only just starting. But it says, by season seven, Galecki, Parsons, and Kuko were receiving 0.2%, 0.25% of the series' back-end money, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you remember how much money these shows made, that that's a lot. quick. Uh, before production began on the eighth season, um, and the three plus um, at Helwig and Nail looked to re- negotiate new contracts with Galecki, Parsons, and Kuko seeking around a million dollars per episode, as well as more back-end money. That's a where you want to get it. That's where you want to get it, yeah. Because that season shit's going to go for life. Yeah, and it says here that by season 10, Helberg and Naya reached the one million per episode parity with Galecki, Parsons, and Kuko due to a clause in their deal signed in 2014. Now, that's different to what Friends did. So we did a video on the Fact Fiend channel a few years ago that the principal actors in Friends all negotiated as a group of five. It's five right six. friends. Six. six, sorry, as a group of six. So during like, the season two, three, where like Ross and Rachel, the will they, won't they? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was Warner Bros. offered Ro- Ross and Rachel's actors, uh, David Schwimmer and Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston, offered them $100,000 more per episode, and they turned that down and instead negotiated as a group to all get paid more. Because they because figured they s- that, that none of them are labelled as main characters and it would cause a lot of friction on set. Yeah, so they thought if we're all paid exactly the same. It's an ensemble show. We don't want any, even though like some episodes focus on us, it's still an ensemble show carried by all of us. So to avoid any of that, they all agreed to, in that case, take a you know a pay cut. But by having the negotiating power of all six of them, because it's like then the studio couldn't like nickel and dime one person or convince one person to take more money. They had to agree with all of them. Which more than anything just shows that when you've got collective bargaining power, it's a lot easier to secure a better deal for everybody. It's weird, isn't it? Like a group of workers all coming together and deciding that either they all get benefits or none of them get the mm-hmm. benefits. It's, yeah, it does create a lot of bargain power. It's weird that no one else has ever thought to do that. 
Similarly, we have here. So in March 2017, the main cast members, um, uh, so that's like, you know, the main five, took a 10% pay cut to allow uh, Bialik and Roosh to increase their earnings. This that's put nice. them on about a $900,000 episode. But we also yeah. meant that they could all get back-end deals as well. Yeah, that's, that's good of them. So, and so they did do it, something similar to that, yeah. It is, like, obviously a bit different in terms of Big Bang Theory because, yeah, there is a hierarchy of the three main characters, mm -hmm. the two other guys... And then the eventual love interests of two of them as well. Yeah. yeah. But I would say that it is an ensemble show similar to Friends, where, like, you know, those main five are in every episode. Yes, but I would say that there's no question if I told you that, you know, Leonard, Sheldon, and Penny were the main three characters. Of course, yeah. Whereas in Friends, you could have that discussion pretty much all day long as you go in and out of seasons. Mm -hmm. And then we have, like, you know, just a couple of sections now, because we're getting a bit long in the tooth here. So, Lucas, I'm going to allow you to pick what we choose to go through. So let me bring up the sections here so we have. Um, recurring themes and elements, which include science, nerd media, Leonard and Penny's relationship, Sheldon and Amy's relationship, Soft Kitty Howard's mother, the apartment building elevator, and vanity cards, or reception. I think specifically we should talk about like you know the nerd representation in this show. Okay, so this is now the subheading recurring themes and elements and the sub subheading nerd in quotation marks. That's how you know it. nerd media. So yeah. the the four main male characters are all avid fans of nerd culture. Among their shared interests are science fiction, fantasy, comic books and collecting memorabilia. And, and I think one of the criticisms of the show isn't it is that they 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 like everything on such a superficial level. Mm -hmm. but then I realized I got an older. No, that's what nerds are like. They only want to like it for the sake of being viewed to like it. Very rarely do nerds actually have a genuine enthusiasm. So at least the kind of nerds portrayed in that show. I guess it's kind of like us with Wiki Weekends, where people mm -hmm. assume that we know a bunch about comics sometimes. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, for the most part, we read a wiki page on a character for half an hour, forget most of the info, and move on with our lives. Yeah, and, you know, liking something casually is perfectly fine. But I think one of the criticisms from the show, at least from people who self-identify as nerds, is that, like, it's so, so like surface level, the, converse, like, the conversation, the jokes around the stuff, of, like, they'll just say, like, um, like I don't... No, any can't recall any specific examples. But I want to like a, the Aquaman thing. That's like, what joke. I was going to mention. Yeah, like oh, because it is pop cult through pop culture osmosis. People know that Aquaman sucks. But if you ask any comic fan, does Aquaman suck? They're like, no, he doesn't. He's actually super fucking powerful. And that's what a nerd, yeah. an actual nerd, would have in response to that. But because they're not writing for the nerds, they're writing for the people who like kind of like comic books, but don't really give too much of a shit about it. Sometimes. They've watched Family Guy and know the meme about yeah. Aquaman being a joke, quote-unquote character, but yeah, these people, these four nerd characters are meant to be portrayed as the most hyper, super, mega nerds that know everything, and then mm -hmm. it's like, they're taking the piss out of Aquaman, going, oh, he's the one in Justice League nobody likes to dress up as. It's like, mm -hmm. no, comic book fans know that Aquaman isn't a joke. Yeah, they like Aquaman. But it says, oh, Star Trek, um, is, in particular, is frequently referenced with Sheldon identifying strongly with the character of Spock. Which makes sense. There's a, there is a distinct visual similarity between Jim Parsons and Leonard Nimoy. A little bit, yeah. And um, I'm surprised that the, the amount of Star Trek cameos they've got in the Big Bang Theory is like. They've had uh, so many cameos. The, uh, the, off the top of my head, I know they've had um, I've got Leonard them, Nimoy, yeah. George Takei, and Will Wheaton. Um, yep. prominently as well. Yep, and William Shatner appeared in one, and LeVar Burton yeah. as well as Brett Spiner. Yeah, Playing yeah. fictionalised versions of themselves. Um, they're also fans of Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, and Doctor Who. James Earl Jones, Carrie Fisher, and Mark Hamill have all made guest appearances. And this is how you know it, it got big when like they yeah. can pretty much pull any you know name out of nerd culture that they want and be like you're gonna come and make a cameo on our show right yeah it's like um the, the fact that they can just say hey we want to get um george decay on an episode and not as well the actual real life scientists they got in are the actual like real important people like they got stephen hawking on a couple episodes oh yeah shit now they had stephen hawking like actual astronauts and astrophysicists and a bunch of cameos like that mm-hmm 
And uh, it's, it's crazy. That's what I mean. It was a cultural juggernaut. So I know like, if we mention it to people who are around our age, that, oh, Big Bang Theory sucks. Like, this was really popular, though. And I, I think, you know, the first few seasons, it's um, kind of a, a bit more liked by more people, especially, you know, I think a, a lot of people that I've spoken to the you know, nerdy, geeky people like myself mm-hmm. and you, I quite enjoyed the idea to start with because it was, mm-hmm. oh, it's a show about geeks. Cool. This is for us. And then it's you not, slowly no. realize over time that like, oh, no, it's not. And then. I think they did an okay-ish job of making it bearable to start with, but yeah. the episode that lost me was just when they get stuck like on the side of the road doing like the Star Trek um, cosplay photos and stuff, and like mm-hmm. people start launching like um, milkshakes at them and stuff, and it, like the show actively says like, "Look at how stupid they are for cosplaying." Yeah, look at how pathetic these characters are for like trying, imbo- like having an interest that they take so seriously and is such a big pivotal part of their lives. That is like, yeah, it's that thing of like, uh, it is too nerd media. What like I don't know, um, like police procedurals are. Mm. And you like CSI is too actual forensic science of like, okay, you get the basic gist of what we're trying to do, but you get almost everything else wrong. <laughs> He says here, speaking of comic books, uh, Wednesday night is the group's designated comic book night, um, because that is the day of the week when new comic books are traditionally released. The comic book store is run by a fellow geek and recurring character, and yeah, I like Stuart, he's alright. On a number of occasions, they themselves have dressed up as pop culture characters, including The Flash, Aquaman, Frodo, Superman, Batman, Spock, The Doctor, Green Lantern, and Thor. And then, you know, because it's Chuck Lorre and you've got all that sexism in there, as a consequence of losing a bet... The group um, uh, are forced to visit the comic book store dressed as Catwoman, Wonder Woman, Batgirl, and Supergirl. Yeah. And it's always those super cheap, like, inflatable-esque muscle suits that, mm-hmm. that like, you know, yeah, it's, no it's always, actual yeah. nerd would go by to wear for an outfit. But someone would, like, you know, we don't want to shit on people like well, you want to show your fandom, but people uh, okay. like that, yeah. that dedicated or supposedly that into this thing, would have, like, Prop accurate costumes, and they all have well paying jobs, so can afford yeah. to get the good costumes, right? Yeah, like they wouldn't be wearing like the hundred dollar off the rack Superman costume. No, and example. you know, I've I've worn like cheap cosplays in the past, but yeah, you know, these people have the money and the know how and the passion to go out and get some better looking suits. So you put, you see all the detail they put into like fucking building a penny a home. PC TV setup or whatever mm. it was, and like all this shit. Like these are these are people who know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, and it says here, this one I didn't actually know. So DC Comics announced that to promote its comics, the company was sponsoring Sheldon to wear Green Lantern T-shirts. Because um, Sheldon, in near enough every episode, is wearing a DC character T-shirt, usually the Flash, which actually became Flash or is... Green Lantern or something. Yeah, and a detail I kind of like that's not mentioned here, but we've done an article on, so I'll reiterate it here is that. Um, you can actually get a hint about what Sheldon's mood is going to be based on his shirt. And it's oh. kind of low-key genius because the character, while never outright stated to be, um, is confirmed by the actor Jim Parsons to be autistic. He's always said, I, I play him as if he is autistic. I did a lot of research on it, and I've had a lot of people who have autism talking to me about how they relate to the character of Sheldon. He is just heavily, never conf- like, he's heavily autistic-coded, but yeah. he's not ever mentioned on the show, I don't believe, to ever be autistic. Yeah, and a lot of criticism was levied against the show in its early seasons for, like, you know, portraying him as weird. And they mm. to their credit, they do soften that in late seasons. And a lot of that to Jim Parsons and the level of, like, creative control he had over his characters. But, like, no, I'm not going to do that. And he did mm. a lot of his own independent research. And they say that because of that, he has trouble expressing his feelings. A lot of the time, he'll try and do that through his clothing. And it's only something that someone who's really into comics would notice. Mm. So, for example, like when he's wearing like um, Flash t-shirts and stuff like that. So, like, you know, he's general, that's his default mood. Mm-hmm. But if he's in a bad mood, you'll see him wear sometimes a red Green Lantern shirt. And red Green Lanterns, people don't know. Do you know, remember, Lucas? Red Lanterns is just anger, right? They're angry, yes. And then sometimes he'll wear a blue one, which is a love or compassion, I think, or mm-hmm. hope. And other one's a pink one. Like when he first meets Amy, I think he wears a pink one, which is love. Oh, okay. 
And just little things like that. Like if you look at the outfits he wears, you can get a detail about his mood and how he feels in that scene. Yeah, that that is, something... as you say, that is pretty low key, really clever. Yeah, it's like you know, this is a character who struggles to express himself through his words, so try to do through his outfits. And that's something Jim Parsons talks about. Of like, there are a lot of little subtle things I did after speaking to people with autism or people who like you know know people with autism. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, that's you know, cool it's... detail. Yeah, and I just I thought it was, and the only time it ever pissed me off is that when they have an episode where he, um, he's in, intensely jealous and they make him red because he's angry. It's like no, because jealousy on the Green Lantern spectrum it's is green. orange. It's orange. Oh, on the on the Green Lantern spectrum, yeah, I, I, I was orange like, one. I just thought you were talking about the color associated with envy, and I was like, oh, well, green for green envy with envy, yes, but it's like in uh, the Green Lantern universe, orange is the color of avarice, not red. Mm-hmm. And it's like, who, who'd have thunk it? Big Bang Theory gets it wrong sometimes. But yeah, so I think we've we've learned a bit. Yeah. We've had a discussion there, but you know, there's much more to cover, but this is Wiki Weekends. We don't go into too much detail. So just a, a broad discussion. About just, like Theory, just like Big Bang Theory. Just like Big Bang Theory. We're not going to actually get into any of the issues. <laughs> oh, dear. Just, yeah, we talked there for longer than two episodes of season 10 of Big Bang Theory. There's Holy more shit. content in like the Wiki... It was discussing one course of the wiki page and there is in two episodes of the final season. So, is it time for adverts, Carl? It's time for adverts, yes. Go on, Lucas. So, Carl, that was just my funny little way, funny to me at least, to try and introduce ourselves to our, our, our break segment within the podcast, but we, unlike the Big Bang Theory, do try to regulate how many, you know, advert breaks... Play that we have during our podcast and stuff, and we like to just have a nice midpoint break here. And I guess if you are looking to sponsor the podcast, as we've mentioned before, you can mm-hmm. contact us at wikiweekends at gmail.com. Uh, that is in the description below. Mm-hmm. And here is where we would like to, you know, place a sponsored segment for you if you're interested. But, Carl, we haven't got a sponsor. We yeah, so let's promote our own stuff, I guess. So we are our own stuff. sponsor. Yeah, why not? That's the thing. We got to go plug some else. Something like the plug our own. So yeah, uh, I guess you can just go follow me over on twitch.tv slash Legend of Canto, and I am currently doing a, a Resident Evil Four knife only challenge run. I'm oh, to be honest, knifing them Ganados. Yeah, I'm doing that on Monday nights, and then Tunic Tuesdays are my Zelda nights, and then. I couldn't find good alliteration for Thursday with Pokemon, but Thursday is my Pokemon night. Mm-hmm. It's like, turns out there are two Pokemon that start with like the TH sound, and that's Thunderous and Throw. And oh. neither of them are Pokemon or names that are ideal for like Throw Thursdays. I'm like, yeah. well, people, what does that mean? Yeah, that's fair enough. And. Um... Like, for my end, I also have a Twitch stream. Um, every Friday night, I will play Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. I have a bunch of dumb <laughs> stuff associated with it. I have, um, uh, like, specified, em- like, specific emotes, including, like, you know, the Nana Machine Sun emote from Armstrong. <laughs> every time you sub to or follow my channel, it'll play a random quote from the game. Because, you know, why not? Why not lean into it? And the other thing I like to promote is that um, uh, my um, Harley Rae Jepsen released a, a new single this week, so go listen to that. I know okay. she doesn't need the promotion, but <laughs> I just thought she released a new song this week, and yeah, go listen to it. No, Carly Bay. As, I was going to say, as Carly always refers to her, Carly Bay Jepsen. Did I ever tell you I had an ex who got really mad that I used to say that? <laughs> like, because like I think my phone background for a joke was a, a picture of Carly Rae Jepsen. Mm. I did it as my phone background, which was really funny, because like, I used to make that joke all the time. It's like, who's that? And I'm like, it's Carly Rae Jepsen. It's like, oh, it's just a singer that I like. It's really funny. I had a crush on her when I was younger, so I thought I'd make her my background. It's like, <laughs> why have you got another girl as your background? So you thought, I'll change it if you want. But then I'd, when I'd listen to like Carly Rae Jetson, you get that Spotify thing pop up. So mm-hmm. like, why are you looking at pictures? It's like, no, it's just the album. I like her song. <laughs> so yeah, you can find Carl over at twitch.tv slash Carlswood. And again, everybody's you know links and stuff can be found in the descriptions, all our socials, mm-hmm. etc. And I guess the only thing else I have to say is, you know, as as we mentioned earlier, comment which wiki won this week and just mm-hmm. give us a like, subscribe, whatever you want to do. It's up to you. Um, but anyway, 
back to the rest of the podcast. And yeah. as I said, Carl, I also picked a TV show. You did? Okay, I'm ready. Oh, I don't know if I am. I'm already regretting picking what I picked. <sighs> that means it's a good one, though. That's, <laughs> that I'm resigned hoping. sigh. I'm hoping. Because <laughs> I just watched a couple of episodes of it. In the okay. background, because I was like, I need something to turn my brain off to while I play some more Tears of the Kingdom. Okay, I'm ready. Let me just... Wait a minute. <sighs> no, I'm ready. Go on. Lay it on me. Are you ready to talk about the DC show Titans? Ooh! <laughs> I am, because Lucas, I've watched every episode. You've watched every episode? I've watched every episode. Okay, so I the only episodes I watched um, this was you know like in the last week. Mm-hmm. Um, I literally was I know at the end of season one there's a Batman thing, mm-hmm. so I just turned on the last episode of the season because bear in mind I've tried watching the first couple in the past and yeah. pieced the fuck out. But then I decided, well, what's the Batman thing, right? So I went to the end of episode. Uh, the end of season one, so that's like episode 11, mm-hmm. watched the recap, watched that episode, and then I watched, I think, the first two episodes of season two, where they follow up upon that story. Ah, uh, We'll get into how much of a train wreck I thought it was, Carl. Yeah, so for me, have you ever seen the film without a paddle? A long time ago. So there's a joke in that, where like, they all get really high. And when they're getting high, they're confessing stuff. One of the guys goes, I watched a gay porno once. The girls okay. never showed up. I was waiting for the girls to show up. And for me, it was like that with Titans, where it's like, it never got good. But I kept watching, because like, well, it's going to get good, right? And then it never got good. It never got good, Lucas. It never got good. I, I knew that the reception for season one was not good, but I was intrigued what they do with the Batman, as Robin famously said... Near the start of the show, fuck Batman. So I'm like, it's my, it's my favorite bit. It start <laughs> literally opens with Robin saying fuck Batman, and it's like I thought, okay, cringe, cringe as fuck. But maybe DC have realized that not everything has to be about Batman. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can tell a story without Batman. They couldn't make it one season before Batman's in it. They it's could like, not. What a way to admit that you're creatively bankrupt. Like we can't make a show without going without Batman. Nope. And it just shows as well, because it was a not long after Gotham happened, where they pledged that this is a show about Jim fucking Gordon. It's about, and they yeah. could not help themselves to immediately start putting Batman, Catwoman, Joker, Penguin, etc. And, you know, villains, I didn't have a problem with, because if you mm-hmm. want to have the, the story of how Jim Gordon dealt with the Penguin being this mobster and gangster and trying to control yeah. Gotham before Batman was around, that could be cool. But it's ostensibly just... an interesting story of, like, what the fuck did Gotham do with all these supervillains before Batman turned up? That's mm-hmm. an interesting premise for a show of, like, how did the Gotham PD deal with, like, Bane before Batman <laughs> showed up? What the fuck are you going to do when Bane shows up? And he's like, apparently well, nothing. What they're going to do is introduce Batman in, I think, about season two. So, it, yeah, um, yeah. it just, you know, it, again, they couldn't help themselves. Batman straight away in season one, after saying, fuck Batman, and having a ostensibly Teen Titans-based show. We never get in it, mate. And the, the best Teen Titans show is still the cartoon. And even Teen Titans Go is pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Um, it's like, it's really fun. It's yeah, really yeah. fun. It's definitely a different type of, you know, art style and humour than Teen Titans younger, yeah. was, but both of them are, are good in their own different ways. Yeah. Teen Titans Go certainly skews younger, but it's still really good. And there's a lot of, like, real deep cuts there. If you imagine deep Big Bang Theory having, like, these, like, surface-level references, there's a lot of, like, real deep pulls in that Teen Titans Go show. And when we talked about the fact that in Big Bang Theory and similar sitcoms, you can pause and wait for every joke... Teen Titans Go is just yeah. it, jokes per second. It is, yeah. It's like imagine just it's Teen Titans for people who watch TikToks. <laughs> and I guess we've got to get into Titans because I decided to talk about this train wreck that was, and we will just B 
be saying fuck it to spoilers. Yeah. So if you are sensitive to spoilers for this show, I would recommend not caring about this show because it's not worth caring about. It's the thing, it spoils itself. Yeah. <laughs> like said, they can't help themselves. They cannot. And I think it says a lot that we'll get into it, but mm-hmm. Batman is not the main villain of the end of season one. They try but so hard to make it like he is, though, don't they? They they make it the entire episode to look like the problem has now become Batman. Yeah, like, oh no, Batman's gone evil. And it's like, what the fuck do you do against Batman? And it's like, oh, it turns out he's not evil. It's actually mm-hmm. a dream. Which means that like, they didn't even have the balls to put Batman in the show. It's not his dream Batman. That you never actually see Batman either in the season one, and clearly they just hadn't cast anybody yet, which they do in season two, but yeah. just let's get into it, shall we, Carl? Yeah, I will say about that scene, divorced of context, that is a very cool scene, and it showcases how scary Batman will be to fight, where it's like 15 guys with machine guns walk into a dark room, and Batman <laughs> like kills them all. Just that would be terrifying. eviscerates everyone. In seconds, and yeah. it's that's how Batman no hold bars would be. Mm-hmm. But yes, Titans is an American superhero television series created by Akiva Goldsman, Jeff Johns, and Greg Belanti. Based on the DC Comics superhero team, the Teen Titans, the series despite the series depicts a group of young heroes who join forces in their fight against evil. Mm-hmm. Featured as members of the ep- the eponymous thought, featured as members of the eponymous Titans, Dick Grayson, Corey Anders, Rachel Roth, Gar Logan, Jason Todd, Donna Troy, Hank Hall, Dawn Granger, Rose Wilson, Connor Ken, and Tim Drake. Mm-hmm. It becomes quite an eclectic cast of how many Robins can we fit in the Teen Titans. It's also as well like. The characters are kind of fun. But my problem with it is, is that the Teen Titans cartoon, it's like, it is, it's so good at riding that line between serious and funny. Mm-hmm. Which you could do with like in live action. You could have like a, a show that deals with serious issues, but has the light heart elements. My issue is though, they kill so many people in that show. They ki- <laughs> it's like when you watch like the Green Arrow show. And just Green Arrow shoots someone every single episode. It's like, how am I supposed to root for a character who shot someone every episode for 20 episodes straight? Because by the end of season one, he realizes that that's a bad thing to do. So he should be forgiven for all his sins, but then yeah. keep going and being a vigilante and not murdering in the uh, the season. And, and that's the thing, yeah. It's like by the end of season one in like Arrow, like he is the biggest mass murderer that city's ever seen. Like he is, in <laughs> arguably, the worst villain in that show. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with Titans, where they keep trying to have these, like you know, these teenage melodrama bits. But I'd have been happy with the teenage melodrama stuff mm-hmm. if they didn't just like intersperse that with like viciously beating people half to death. Because it again, like many DC things, having the problem since the Dark Knight trilogy happened, they take themselves way too seriously. Yeah, which just clashes horribly with the tone of teenagers with superpowers, which they could have done. I would have been very, like, you know, because you know what show did that well? Young Justice, which was incredible. Yes, yes, really good. Or Teen Titans. That's the thing. If you want a fix, a Teen Titans, don't watch Titans. You've got Young Justice, Teen Titans, and Teen Titans Go that all have different flavors of doing the Teen Titans characters and the DC Teen characters well. Yeah. Like there's um, already a better version of this show that exists. Yeah, in multiple ways. <laughs> and it's just... I mean, I don't... I know that this clearly did not have much of a budget, but... It's, it's fucking Warner Brothers. It's, there's <laughs> no... It's fucking Warner Brothers. It is. The, but, they own everything. But they like to spend a little and get a lot back. Yeah. And it's just the idea that they wanted live-action Teen Titans, but, well, we can't afford to have a cyborg man in okay. the budget. That's fair enough, yeah. The CGI would have to be constant in every scene, 
And then how about we put Beast Boy in, but he can only turn into a tiger and he will only use that power once every two episodes. The fact that even in the latest season, he can't turn into any other animal. <laughs> it, it is like, I, I was like pulling my hair out of just like how, do you know that thing of like, when you watch like the, the classic things like Star Trek of like, you show them use like their gun to solve every problem. It's like, why don't you just mm. do that? It's like the amount of times I'm looking like turn into a tiger. Yeah. And he's there, he's like hiding didn't from... have any budget left for the episode. He's like, he's like hiding from villains. I don't know what to do. Like, turn into a tiger. <laughs> turn And the fact that he only ever turns into a tiger, and he never thinks... Because like, that's the, one of the interesting things about Beast Boy, is that how, how is he going to get out what the creative problem solving that he comes up with with his powers of... Like one episode where, like, you know, Cyborg throws him as, like, a vol, and he turns into a blue whale halfway through. Yeah, exactly. Just, uh, why... <laughs> If you could turn into one animal out of any animal, you would probably be, fuck it, let's turn into like a giant blue whale and just jump from rooftops and crush people. It's, and that's one of the things, like the fact that he only ever turns into a tiger. And uh, very rarely. Very, very rarely. So that's <sighs> one character missing, one character with just a, a non-move set, essentially. Yeah. And then... I think Starfire CG looks real bad on her it powers, and then rough, yeah. she's super neutered again in terms of not being able to fly and you know do all of her extra stuff. It's just she kind of shoots a bit of fire out of her hand. Yeah, and I will um, say, characterization wise she is closer to her comic counterpart, where she is a very sexually charged character, and mm-hmm. they portray that in the show where she's like you know flirting with a fucking a lot of men. But I'll say like. That's the one time where I don't mind you deviating from the comics because that comic trope is really fucking sexist. And yeah. the Starfire in the Teen Titans show was much better because it's like fish out of water and that led to a lot of comedy. Yeah, they, the flirtation they really was wanted, more innocent. They really wanted to have Robin and Starfire be adults and then um, Raven and Beast Boy be teenagers. So you keep the Teen Titans aspect of it, but oh, now we can show... Robin and Starfire being able to go and fuck around. Yeah. So and it's just as a fan of the original, I much preferred when it was like innocent flirtation because mm-hmm. you know that's like what, what being a teenager was like. You know, when you watched when I watched the show as a teenager, I liked that, and as an adult watching back, it's like, oh yeah, you know, that's what being a teenager is like. It just reminds me that thing like you know innocent teenage flirtation. I don't need to see them kill people. <laughs> yeah, and just oh, it it. Really hurts me to just see that picture of I I don't associate. I'm just gonna go look at a the, picture of the cast now. Yeah, Team I don't. Tight. I want to look even at the, the, cast. the original four. I'm just looking at a picture of them here. Is that? I guess Robin kind of looks like dark gritty Robin does, but then like even Raven, who at least has the gray skin. Some, yeah. Well, she's got pale skin. She's like, still just yeah a, a white and she, girl. And she in has this like the picture. thing on her head as well. Uh, she doesn't in this picture. She no. she gets out at the start of season two. So they weren't even willing to commit to the diamond in the head yeah. look for Raven yet. And oh, I, I, I almost forgot as well. Then, I forgot about Dove and Hawk, mate. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they I come, forgot about they in. just put in, like, adults. Yeah. Um, I forgot about that. Oh, they put in, like, Kimiko, but not Kimiko. <laughs> They oh, little, is, is they that little, who? Little baby Kimiko with the eye patch. Oh, right, okay. Slade's daughter. Oh. And, yeah, as I say, I've only watched a few of these episodes, but that was enough for, A, for me to watch the first two, I think, episodes of season one and say, I don't want to watch this anymore. And then yeah. just go in, well, what does the Batman bit look like, at least? And it was just, it was a bit better, but not much better. And then... As we say, it all turns out to be a dream, Carl. Of course it does, yeah, because that's cheaper. So, I guess we can do a quick bit of premise, and then I'll talk about my, my rage and frustration. Do it, yeah. I'm just looking at the screenshots. Like They even put Crypto the Superdog in it. Yeah, but they, they tease Super... I presume Superboy, not Superman, and then yeah, Crypto Superboy. the Superdog... At the end of season one, and again, they just couldn't help themselves. They had to, at the last minute of you know season one, just be like, "Here's Batman, here's Superboy, here's uh, like Trigon, which is fair enough. Here's Crypto, the Superdog. 
just calm down. I thought the best bit about Superboy is as well. Like, he's Superman, so he's completely invincible. Mm-hmm. They have multiple times where they have fist fights, and, like, Superboy won't help because they don't want him to. Because like, he's have, too they, powerful or something. No, they have bits where it's like, okay, we need to break into this army thing, and you have Robin saying, I'll do it, and it's like, Superboy's right there. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, it's that thing of, like, obviously, because the budget can't. It's, it's that Superman problem, isn't it? Like, the Justice League of mm-hmm. Superman will just walk in and solve the problems. So, like, if you watch, like, Justice League Unlimited, they always have Superman conveniently busy. Saving mm-hmm. the day somewhere else because if he's there, it makes no sense why you're having a discussion about what you're going to do to solve the problem. And it's but they just have it and they'll have like they'll show Superboy just sat eating a sandwich while they're discussing. We don't know what to do against this problem. Superboy's <laughs> right there. He's invincible. It's that thing, isn't it? Of when you've got characters like Green Arrow and Batman yeah. sitting in a room with Superman and the Flash. Superman and the Flash can ostensibly be the Justice League if they wanted to. Yeah, Batman's basically admin in a lot of the comics. <laughs> he, he bankrolls them and works admin. And we're, you know, being hyperbolic for the sake of comedy here. Like, don't come yeah. in the comments of like, oh, well, Batman does this and Wonder Woman provides it. It's Superman and the Flash alone are so powerful. And Wonder Woman is also up there as well. Yeah. But when you've got Green Arrow and the Batman and Mark and they're Man sat Hunter next to each other, and is that thing, Cyborg, yeah. and like, that's the he, thing. I don't mind that they're there. It's just that I don't like when you've got Robin talking about I should be in charge, I should lead the charge on this dangerous mission. When the bulletproof, invincible person with laser <laughs> eyes is sat next to him, and that's another thing that they couldn't help themselves with. And it does make a bit more sense when it's an aged-up Robin that's already said mm-hmm. "fuck Batman" straight away. Is just introducing Dick Grayson almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it does make sense with Robin being so much older, but that again, so many of these things could have been a wait for season two moments. Because you know, it's not hard to tell a good story with the base few characters of Teen Titans. It's really not. Do you know what I've noticed while I'm looking at some of the posters for Titans, and they just straight up fucking lie on the posters sometimes because they show Beast oh, really? Boy with, they show Beast Boy with green skin. So yeah, they're showing another... like mid transformation and stuff. Because people don't know Beast Boy. One of the reasons why he, his green skin is because he was experimented on, and he's mm. ostracized and becomes a part of a freak show. And the reason why he ends up joining the Teen Titans because he, he finds that sense of belonging. And they kind of have that in the show. It's like people picking him for having green hair, and it's like Luke's a son with brightly coloured hair. Do you buy for a second? I mean, people can't tell very much, but I do. Yeah. I do colour my hair a bit of pink in it at the moment. But he's ostracized when you clearly see that three of the four characters in that original main cast all have brightly colored hair yeah it's like i know they're not ostracizing him but clearly it's not an uncommon thing but uh titans follows the young superheroes of the eponymous team as they combat evil and other perils i don't know what else they're fighting just perils perils like perils sure uh, disbanded when the story begins, the series sees the team return when the original and new members reform the Titans. But it's just straight I away. I forgot about the episode team one. Titans the Titans are done. With, the Titans are over. Oh, it was in media res, and there's whatever the fuck that shit is. <laughs> so oh. the Titans fight crime throughout various locations, including Detroit, San Francisco, Gotham City, and Metropolis. So wherever it's cheap is to film, got it. Yep. Um, so the first members of the team to appear in the series are Batman's former vigilante partner, Dick Grayson, known as Robin, uh, extraterrestrial Corey Anders, who is Starfire, empath Rachel Roth, who is Raven, and shapeshifter, slash maybe not shapeshifter in this show, Gar Logan, who is not Beast Boy, but is Beast Boy. Is he even a shapeshifter if he can turn into one thing? <laughs> Exactly. It's just they should just call him Tiger Man. Tiger Man. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I'm reminded. I remember like Justice League Unlimited. There's a great episode of that where it's like all the heavy hitters are busy with like some thick shit in space. Mm. They have a parade, and they have to send the fucking jobbers down to the parade, and all the crowds <laughs> like ooh the like shining night and stuff like that. Who oh, the no. fuck are these idiots? And they have to deal with the fact, like, oh, yeah, God, like, we're, like, total jobbers. No one knows who we are because Superman just saves the day. They could have done that. They could, like, played off that insecurity heroes might have, like, in a world where Batman and Superman exist. What the fuck is Robin? 
going to do. Speaking of jobbers, Carl. Okay. Dick Grayson is later. Dick Grayson is later revealed as one of the original Titans, alongside half Amazon Donna Troy and crime fighting duo Dawn Granger and Hank Hall, aka Dove and Hawk. God, I they should have got their own show so they could stay the fuck away from Titans. The like, actors are great, but it's it's so weird because they they're clearly mid thirties to forties. Yeah, yeah, and they, they try are, and talk about very how very like, adult. And they're talking to like Robin of like we were all part of the same team together. It's like Robin is clearly like fifteen years younger than that. It's <laughs> so weird. And I don't actually have too much of a problem with what I saw of the cast, to be honest. The cast are fun. They've got good chemistry. They they were doing a good job with the schlock they got given. And I actually think one of the the standouts of you know, again, playing the character that they've been written well was um, not Dick Grayson, Jason Todd. Yeah, he like, play, he's such a little in, shit. Is the the shit eating Robin that's like, nah, man, I'm the best. I was like, yeah, I dislike your character, but in the sense of like, he's doing a good job in that role. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'm hot shit. I'm the new Robin. Mm-hmm. Fuck you. And he's also the only one who looks like he's having any fun. Exactly. He's the only one that looks like he's having fun being a superhero. So these shows are supposed to be like, you know, oh, I'm watching this as escapism, and it's like, oh, being a superhero must be great, and it's just them crying because their lives are shit. It's like, oh, well, I like shit, and I ain't got a billion dollars. Well, speaking of when life gets shit, Carl, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to it, because I watched, as I say, the recap from season one, episode 11, mm-hmm. where it tells you what's happened so far in a couple of minutes, and then next thing I know, Dick Grayson is lying in a pool in his garden where his kid runs out and like comes and plays with him. And then Dove, his wife, is pregnant with a second child. Mm-hmm. And then Jason Todd comes in a wheelchair to his house and says Batman's going to kill the Joker. Yeah, and it's as well that... I mentioned like, the age of the actors there. That's really uncomfortable. They mentioned that like, Jason, uh, Dick Grayson had a relationship with Dove. I, I think in the flashbacks he looks really young. They they like play him to be quite, and it's like, hang yeah. on, because I th- you know he's meant to have just recently been part of the Teen Titans, so he's meant to be young adult. Yeah, and then as teen you say, t- like, the emphasis there is on teen, and uh, obviously. Dove and Hawk were also part of that team, but as you say, there does look like there's an age disparity. Especially like Hawk. Hawk looks like he's got a good ten years on Dick Grayson. Yeah, I think it's well because the actor is just so massive. Yeah, like, he's he's a huge dude. He's a good actor. Mm-hmm. I just wish it just doesn't suit that show. But yeah, it, it's just very strange, and that, you know, it's Gotham is way worse than it was. Uh, do you remember the Riddler? Well. I went in to fight the Riddler. Turns out Riddler uses guns now and shot me in the spine and I'm paralyzed. And that's from that's from Jason Todd. And that's what? And he's, oh yeah, Commissioner Gordon's dead. Okay. Gotham's gone to absolute shit and Batman's about to cross the line. And Lucas you, Edge. you know what happens if if Batman crosses the line, right? It's like there's no coming back. And the only person that can save him is you, Dick. How many people have the Titans killed at that point? <laughs> how many people have like Dove, how many people have like Dove and Hawk killed? <laughs> That's what makes the show so annoying. Mm-hmm. So that, let's see, it's the same thing that Arrow kept doing, where like Oliver Queen shoots someone in every episode of season one. He kills a person, and then in all his flashbacks, he's murdering people left, right, and center. Mm-hmm. So like we're chasing this guy. He shot a woman. It's like okay, that's terrible. <laughs> how many people have you shot? <laughs> And they keep, and they start thinking of like, they keep framing it as if like the character has any sort of moral high ground. Because obviously they have the big bad of each season where, yeah, they're going to destroy a whole city, but what have you got to do in the meantime? I'll take down some drug dealers. It's like, oh, all right, you're a mass murderer though, mate. (laughs) How many notches are on those arrows? But as well, like Red Hood. It's that whole thing of like the Batman quote of like, oh, if you kill. If you kill someone, if you kill a murderer, the number of murderers in the world remains the same. So, like, Red Hood's like, okay, so kill 20, got it. He's like, wait, no, 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 don't do that. He's like, okay, got it, Batman. Just Danny DeVito. 
<laughs> that is that is what's terrifying about Red Hood is yeah, that he's like, he just let's shoot them all. Batman's like, I'm never going to use a gun because that's what killed my parents, and I'm, I'm never going to cross the line and kill a person, even though we you know he definitely does. Um, he at least kills a few people. Exactly, many people. But yeah, just Red Hood's like, fuck it. It's like, get guns are going, and um, yeah. So you get all that uh, backstory about Batman. And then Dick Grayson goes to, you know, a terrible Gotham because this prostitution is the most awry. Like, they could not make it more clear 20 times. There's a lot of prostitutes here. But he's, he's lousy city. with prostitutes. Um, As so, we all know, the, what, the sign of cultural decline is the presence of the world's oldest profession. <laughs> but God. You know, there's prostitutes everywhere. Yeah. It's crawling with people punching each other and a lot of prostitutes. Why was anyone living there? <laughs> I don't know. It's just that thing in it of like, why the fuck does anyone live there? And then the. But it's it's gets... like a war zone. I mean, like, that's the. I remember yeah. watching this episode. It's a war zone. And then he you go gets... to. And the next episode, you see where he's living. It's like, he's perfectly fine. It's like, why the fuck is anyone there? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, Dick Grayson gets in a taxi at the airport. Just waiting in the taxi rank. And he goes, oh, can I go downtown? He's like, I, I, I don't do downtown. Can I go to midtown? I don't do midtown. He's like, okay, so why are you a taxi driver then? I tell get you. that Gotham is shit, but you are just eliminating your entire business by not driving anywhere in Gotham. Yeah. And anyway, uh, he gets, you know, something like Batman, like Dick Grayson reaches out or tries to, uh, Batman doesn't you know, reach back, and then mm -hmm. Joker turns out he's been thrown off a building into a car. Oh, and no, Batman not tried. Joker. <laughs> Batman tried to kill him, but failed. Um, so you can't even so do Dick... that right. No, he, he he failed his first murder, and then uh, the Joker's you know in critical condition in the hospital. Robin goes like, "Look, Batman, you. I know you tried to cross the line, but you haven't yet. You still can be redeemed." So then, what Batman does? Is he says, "All right, bet," and he murders Joker in critical condition in the hospital, and then immediately goes to Arkham Asylum, murders everyone, and it's not just the supervillains; he murders the actual, you know, just clinically insane regular people in there. He kills the guards, he kills the nurses. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, so you've immediately gone from what could have been an interesting story to Batman's completely irredeemable. Yeah, you just realise, wow, it's super easy. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy to just kill everyone. Oh, uh, and although I, I am, and I know there's like a long-winded comic explanation why Batman doesn't. I will never get why he doesn't kill the Joker. I just, just specifically, the Joker always say, "Oh, it's a slippery slope." It's like, but it's called the slippery slope fallacy. Mm -hmm. It's like the Joker is irredeemably evil and has killed like tens of thousands of people. He's responsible for untold. Misery and carnage, fuck him. And is that thing like where do you draw the line? Okay, after like your hundredth murder, let's just say maybe af after you killed a hundred people, then you get the death penalty. And oh, they're, just, they're like taxing you know, billionaires. Maybe, maybe when he murders one of his proteges in cold blood, mm. maybe when he shows up at Barbara Gordon's fucking front door and just shoots her in the spine. Yeah, do you like that thing of like bill taxing billionaires? Like. Where does it stop? How about after you've earned like, your second billion dollars? <laughs> how about that? That's how much money you're allowed to. So that thing of like, once you've killed your hundredth person, then you get the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like it's always portrayed as well. Batman's such an unstable character that the moment he breaks that rule once with Joker, he will do what he did in this show of just murder everyone in sight. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no new he will answer. never stop murdering everything at that point. Like, okay, sure, Batman's completely insane as well, but I don't think that... I still think, yeah, the greater good would just be to, to get rid of Joker. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure all that all ends up being a dream. So, yeah, it does all end up being a dream, but... Because, you, you know, know what? That show would be too interesting. But it's, before it's that... Before that, you have to get a scene where... Um, Dick Grayson then is like, Batman, I've had enough. We're coming in to get you alive. Um, they send in, you know, a bunch of the Gotham PD mm -hmm. with like machine guns and shotguns and demolition experts and 
the captain and then also Starfire just behind the lines as well. And yeah, Batman just, as you say, in quite a cool scene, Batman murders just every single cop in a dark room instantly the moment they turn into the Batcave. Just like they get in, the lights go out, Batman just murders everyone with a batarang to the throat. Mm -hmm. And then Starfire shows up and Batman's like, you know, stood with his back to Starfire, and Starfire thinks, "Oh yes, of all characters, I have the drop on Batman." Yeah, Batman guy just be- turns around and freezes her to death. This is that thing, isn't it? Like, I've got the drop on Batman. That guy who beats up Superman on the reg. <laughs> the guy who Superman's scared of. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get a drop on him. Um. So then they just drop a building on Batman. They drop Wayne Mansion on top of Batman, and then Robin goes and murders Batman. And it turns out it was all a dream. That whole five years was a dream to try and convince Dick Grayson to become evil for Trigon. And the only reason it existed is so they can put stuff that was interesting in the trailer to convince you to watch it. Exactly. And Uh, again, they don't have a Bruce Wayne. They don't ever show Batman's face because they haven't cast him for the next season yet. And it's all just a bullshit hypothetical to, as you say, get people hype and get people like myself sticking around because it's like, well... I, I wasn't interested in the first couple of episodes, but they did show a trailer where like Dick Batman. Grayson and Batman come to a head. Like that could be interesting. So is there any trope that puts you off watching something harder than it was a dream? Probably it's like, not. Because that's the thing that like, most like shows at least wait till the ending to do that, so you feel pissed off, but you've already watched it. They at did least this, you're like, done with it. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. You, they say it, but it's like that thing, and it's like, ah, you already watched the entire thing. Fuck you. This one. Episode two of like season two. It's like so you've already you've pulled the rug out from under me, but <laughs> you've not done the thing. Of, you should save that for the end of the season. Well, it was the end of the se- It was the end of season one, but that was se- yeah, an the interesting premise for the end of the first season. And it turns out it was all just a fucking goddamn dream that didn't mean jack shit. But Lucas, wasn't it real cool when Batman showed up and killed everyone? I admit that one action scene with Batman was done relatively well. Yeah. Doesn't it feel good when the universe has no stakes? Doesn't that feel and good? Doesn't it feel good watching media where there's no stakes? And then obviously, um, you know, Trigon just at the start of season two then makes them all bad evil in a matter of seconds mm-hmm. rather than the five years it needed to turn Dick Grayson because apparently... Well, the moment Dick Grayson went evil, the rest of the Titans are basic. They were basically already there. Yeah, they're useless. They to, he has to like look at them bad. Um, and everyone else is like, "Let's get on board. Let's all go super evil." And then all obviously, murder, yeah. Raven just looks at Dick Grayson and goes, "Dick Grayson, you're a good guy, though." He's like, "Oh shit, yeah, I was. Okay, let's I let's end him. Trigon." I, I forgot it was guy. evil. <laughs> so Trigon, I, I, I thought he was a good guy. For how many people he like fucking viciously beats <laughs> after death? So Trigon, you know, the season finale spent five years simulating Robin's life in his brain and manipulating him to become evil. And Raven goes, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You're a good guy. And he goes, oh, shit, yeah. I forgot that. I did forget that. And then they all go against Trigon. And it's all happily ever after. Yeah. Isn't that great? I hate when TV shows do that. Of Like the thing they like, you know, leave the cliffhanger on, get solved in the first episode. Yeah, because they don't want to. Because they want to introduce a new big bad that you then have to get hyped for to get because another season made. Of course, they didn't want to, you know, end season one on Trigon. Because why would you do that in a Teen Titans show? It's like they could have at least ended that again. They could, the end of the season could have at least been that of just getting rid of Trigon and then we set up. But they set up the idea that oh no, season two. It's going to be all about evil Dick Grayson and the Titans getting corrupted. And then it's just solved with Raven being like, yeah, but how about you don't? Yeah. And I will say that maybe the, the my favourite thing, I, I had subtitles on because I was, say, I was just playing Zelda course, yeah. wanted something in the background. And I think maybe my favourite thing is the fact that they caption Dick Grayson as just Dick. <laughs> so it leads to when Dick Grayson is like playing with his kid just the caption, Dick growling, Dick's growling. Comes it's, up. it's really, it's, really immature, it's like, but it's actually super funny. 
And then just he continues chasing him through the house. So it's like his dick continues growling. <laughs> was like, just casually in the background, just seeing the caption, dick continues growling. I'm it's like, just, oh, no. just gives you a little giggle. Just a little giggle. And that was maybe the most enjoyment I had out of watching those few episodes. But I think the most enjoyment you can get out of that show is watching out of context clips of like people like dressing him down, like, shut up, dick. <laughs> And it, it, I know that it's just a nickname for Richard, and we're being a little bit silly, a little bit immature. But sometimes it's just fun to be a bit immature. And it's so I funny really... to see Batman say it like, dick, 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 dick. You really thought this would all come down to this? It's like, yes, Batman. So you can just take the screenshot out of context. Yeah. Can't you? And be like, oh no, when your girl wants to go another round, it's like, dick, you're not ready. <laughs> it's like, I just. I will just, you know, we've got critical response here. We've already um, had the Lucas response, that's enough, right? The the Lucas response. What was the was critical response? I'm curious. Bad. <laughs> the, <laughs> Is that, I hope he just says that. The critical <laughs> response. Bad. So, I guess this is, um, I'm presuming this is audience, because they go for Rotten Tomatoes. Metacritic had 11 reviews of season one, um, and it averaged 55 out of 100. That's rating rough, isn't it? You can't even get your then, people to review that shit. <laughs> and then Metacritic didn't even have a season two or three rating because no I way. guess no one deemed it worthy of reviewing after season one. Oh my god, um, there's, a, there's a new new season out. It's on Netflix. There is. There's season four coming out, or that is out. And um, the Rotten Tomatoes, I, again, I have to assume this is audience and not you know yeah. actual critics because these are surprisingly high. A season one, a 78% positive rating, mm-hmm. 81% positivity on season two, and 100% positivity based on 20 reviews for season three. And I guess at that point, maybe it's just because the only people left watching are the people who really like it. Yeah. Why do they not just lean into it being like melodrama? Like, Riverdale did really well, and mm-hmm. that's wank. And I can see with the cast being good... If they, uh, presumably, it if it does get better, it does focus more on the interpersonal relationships. But mm-hmm. the the cast seemed decent. It just seemed to absolutely not have any confidence in its own premise and yeah. also have zero budget. And they try to tell a story bigger than what the, it needs to be. So if you got faith in your characters, just put it in Titan's Tower. So this is the, the ideal show for Slice. Put it in Titan's Tower. Have like one ep- first episode, all your budget, solve a crime. Mm-hmm. They all meet each other, they all become a team. The rest of the season is just them hanging out. Yeah. And, and then we, we why, talked about Big why? Bang Theory. Just to have it like a show like that, where it's it's the um, just have like, you know, will they won't they between like Robin and Starfire, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Done. And it's one of those of like, I don't understand as well. I think it look they teased from where I was ending it, the the villain then becomes Slade. Oh, yeah. And I think maybe, especially with the low budget of the first season, because they want to see how it does, you should probably open with Slade Wilson. As a villain, and then, because it's a guy in a costume, not a giant demon entity, which is way harder even to replicate. When, even when Trigon does turn into actual Trigon, he's just like an eight foot tall goat man with four eyes. Like, how, is it, yeah, how do they not think, let's just make it Slade? Because mm-hmm. he's just a guy in a costume. We can exactly. put anyone in that fucking thing. It's so much cheaper to you. Low, already low budget. You're clearly low budget because you can't get more than one beast out of beast, man. Like, why would you make Trigon like that villain already? You save it. Yeah. And they, 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 they uh, again, they can't help themselves. They can't save things for later, seemingly, with these kind of shows. And um, we mentioned earlier, there's yes. one thing I want to talk about as we close off here. Yes. Um, it says Arrowverse and I was oh, not was that aware crossover? that this was part of the Arrowverse crossover stuff as well it might have been Legends of Tomorrow like go through time and shit, is that what it is? so it says main article Crisis on Infinite Earths of Arrowverse of course that's it it's like, the Titans incarnations of Hank Hall, Jason Todd, Rachel Roth Corey Anders and Dawn Granger make cameo appearances in the Arrowverse crossover event Crisis on Infinite Earths, um, with 
all of the people, you know, taking their respective roles through archival footage. Oh, so they didn't even get them. Oh. They couldn't even get them in for a, like, they couldn't get me for a five minute cameo. <laughs> they had to just use archive footage. They couldn't even get them on the sound stage when they were doing like end of a season. Like, you don't want to just do five minutes in costume. <laughs> in front of a green screen, we can see you oh. like now. And that's one of the beauties of like, you know, reading these wikis, like taking You've... a glance at them beforehand. But I didn't realise that that moment was coming up. Like, they couldn't even just get them as a cameo. Oh, and the events depicts Titans as being set on the world of Earth 9. Uh, Breck Bassinger appeared in the fourth episode, Dude, Where's My Gar? Um, and then this doesn't, this is not a well written sentence here. Um, well, it's not a well written show, so. No, it's not. And then it should have like some break in the sentence or something, but we're reprising her role as Stargirl from Stargirl. The series. God, that's a thing in Earth it. Two of the Arrowverse multiverse. Yeah, Stargirl on Prime. Woo! So I think what that's saying is that Beast Boy also appeared reprising his role in the Stargirl show. Okay. So I think that's what he's trying to say there. But that that one sentence was constructed very poorly and threw me off a lot. But yeah, they they at least I guess got the actor in for the show and not just like oh here's some archive footage. Oh dear, dear oh dear. And have you got any closing thoughts considering you've watched three seasons of this? I didn't realize there was a fourth season out, so I guess you've got to go watch that now. But uh, <laughs> my only thing is just. It had so much promise of a Teen Titans TV show. It just they did that thing of lean into that grim, dark, edgy shit that mm-hmm. everybody hates. That's the even the people who like it don't like watching it for four seasons because four seasons of grim, dark, edgy shit gets old real fast. And that's, it's that's, hard to you know maintain that when your starting point is fuck Batman. Yeah, like you've already started at a real edge lord grim dark level at that point I was like that had to be your first bit is like fuck batman can you think of like any bit of media that's gotten like you know audience at home let us know if there is one like that got that's had longevity and its whole thing is based on that that grim dark edge shit like not tongue-in-cheek like actually Mm. leaning super hard into like titans i don't mean like you know Sonic the Hedgehog or something like that. Wait, like, Edgy the Hedgy. Yeah, it's like, you know, they play with it. I mean, like, full on. Like, no, fuck this. Like, you know, ugh, Edge. And we're not talking about the Dark Knight trilogy. We're talking about the Dark Knight trilogy inspired things. Where like they've Zack Snyder's movies, yeah. One that, step further. And yeah. again, yeah, uh, people got real... T- uh, uh, vast General majority... Audiences, yeah. General, general audiences. audiences got very fed up with like the Snyderverse tone very Within quickly. Within about three of, like, movies, yeah. Let the children die, Ken. Yeah. It's like, it's like, I know there's all, like, a fan base film, but like, general audiences did not respond well to that, and that series died after like, three or four movies. Mm-hmm. And that's what I mean. I, that, I think that's generally held true for everything I can think of that leans hard into that edgy aesthetic. Yeah, off the top of our head. So comment section, let us know. And just to clarify again, not something that has edgy elements, something that fully leans into the grim, dark, just dour, depressing um, uh, worldview. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the Snyderverse or the Titansverse. So look how many seasons Arrow got after that stopped being, trying to be like fucking Batman 2.0, when they started realising, oh, crossover with a Flash and so used bot single arrows. They're like well, 12 seasons. Thing. Yeah, because um, Arrow was that. Initially, uh, yeah. And they know, leaned initially. away from it so hard. Because they saw the success of the Flash, right? And also because, because the Flash like came it. out and was super light-hearted, and you know Grant Gustin gave a very inspirational, hopeful performance rather than like everything is bad. And it's like people really enjoyed that. Do you know what it was? It was the relationship between um, Oliver and the lady playing Felicity. Mm-hmm. It was that Stephen Amell and that lady. Their relationship is what changed the entire tone of the show. And you'll have fans mm-hmm. of the original Grim Dark Town say that's the point where the show got bad. But if you go look at the numbers, that's the point where the show started to get (laughs) millions more people watching because it turned it into a just drama with superheroes in it. And people really responded to that because generally it's a lot easier to watch a show where you're seeing attractive people have a good time than just people being murdered. 
yeah, it's just really not that hard to have grounded show without all that grim dark shit. It's, it really can be done quite easily. It's like mm-hmm. you can set a world where you have realistic settings but have fun still. Yeah, because like even the shows that deal with really dark, macabre stuff, I think about like every police procedural mm-hmm. where they like deal like, like something like Special Victims Unit. Which deals with like the most heinous kind of crime, imagine like you no know, sex crimes, usually against like the vulnerable. They still have those moments of levity in the show. They have those interpersonal character relationships. So you've got a reason to keep coming back. Like, you, the world tone is dark and depressing, but you do have those moments of levity, mm-hmm. which I think are basically critical to that like, sort of media success. And just, just Titans didn't have enough of that. It just needed to take itself a little bit less seriously and have a bit more beasts for Beast Man. <laughs> it's like, oh, I will never let that go. The Beast Boy is just Tiger Man. It should be Tiger Man. It's, it's depressing. And the fact that you said, you know, you've watched three seasons of it and you just never became Beast Boy. You just stayed Tiger Man. He never gets green skin. And he never gets green skin. So I was yeah. hoping, oh, maybe what they're going to do is he'll go through a secondary mutation. He'll get his green skin. They never do that. It's a shame. What a shame. You know, a lot of wasted potential. Speaking of wasted potential, don't waste the potential of um, the next episode of this show by not liking and subscribing. That was a bad segue. <laughs> it was, it was. Uh, thank you all for watching. And I know this was a bit of a longer one, but hopefully everyone enjoyed it and let us know which wiki won this week. Some good stuff in there. Yeah. Just, you know what? Fuck Titans. <laughs>